Okay, in our investigation of light, we are going to rediscover Snell's Law. Snell's wonderful little law pertaining to waves. And we had seen before this idea of refraction and the index of refraction was related to a couple things and specifically the velocity ratio of the of two media. All right, so speed of waves in one medium and then the other has to do with how much refraction there is. So we have the incident and refracted mediums. So this will be true in light as well. So speed of light, we've all heard that phrase. Well, in a vacuum, which is almost the same thing as in air, it's symbolized by C. And the value of the speed of light is a constant. In a vacuum, it is a specific constant, which is real close to 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, 300 million. Now, the index for refraction is N, and it's defined as the speed of light in the incident medium divided by the speed of light in the refracting medium. And so we saw that the index of refraction in Snell's Law was defined in terms of those speeds. And it also related to angles that are produced in the incident and refracted mediums also. But this is a real easy formulation. The index of refraction, ratio of the speeds. The speed of light over the speed that the light takes in a non-vacuum medium. So C is just the speed of light in a vacuum. Now air is very similar to a vacuum and so that ratio ends up giving us 1.0003 for all practical purposes that's just one so we assume that the speed of light in air is right around C which it is. For any other material of consequence for the speed of light where it's not so close we just say that the speed for any material is C over the index of refraction. That comes obviously from this equation here. There you go. So for instance, if we want to know the speed of light in diamond. Now diamond has a high index of refraction, 2.42. So you just do the ratio. Speed of light divided by that gives you C over 2.42, about 41% the speed of light in a vacuum. 1.2, basically 124 million meters per second. Really slows down, which incidentally ends up being why diamonds sparkle a lot. But we'll get to that later. So in brief, this reduction in the speed of light that is experienced by light passing through a non-vacuum medium, think of it as absorption and remission of the light the photons by the atoms of the materials called scattering. So you can think of it as taking a little bit of time for that process to happen. So it slows down the progress of the motion of the light through the material. Well, getting a little more practical then, how refraction occurs and how it functions in two different media we start by defining the two mediums with different indices of refraction. So we have the index of refraction of air and water. Water is more than air. All right, and so let's draw normal to the surfaces. In this case, N2 is greater than N1, so the ray of light is gonna be incident from the air upon the water, and the incident angle, as we defined earlier, is the angle between the ray and the normal, that's the incident angle. Now we get a little bit of reflection of the light, but that's not the main feature here. The main feature is most of the light passes through into the other medium, in this case the water. Because it slows down in the water, it bends it in, it bends it toward the water itself. So the reflected angle <coughs> between the ray and the normal is actually less. That's the refracted ray. If we reverse the process and you're in the water with your light, your incident angle here uh, is now corresponds to N1, which is the water in this case. A little refla reflected, uh, reflected 
light ray as well. But then most of the light gets out of the water and into the air. And in this case, it bends away from the normal, as you can see here. So it's essentially, this path coming in is reversed if you go the other way. As far as how these angles relate and the indices of refraction, n1 sine of theta 1 is equal to n2 sine of theta 2. And that is a statement of Snell's law. And we're all very happy about that. It's very easy to apply. Okay, you can put them in ratios, but that's a nice way to express it. So if light enters a medium where n2 is greater than n1, like in this case, then the light is bent toward the normal. Toward the normal. In the other case, if it's if it's if n2 is is less than n1, if n2 is less than n1, then the light is bent away from the normal. And that's the essential character of the refraction of light between two different media. I would now like to do a couple of examples using Snell's Law to work problems, understanding the motion of light through materials. In the first case, we have a chunk of flint glass immersed in water, and there is an incident beam from the water onto the flint glass, which by the way has a high index of refraction. The water is less at 1.33. But the incident angle is 60 degrees here. So what's the angle of refraction? All right. So basically, write Snell's law in terms of the index of refraction and the sine of the angles. We have n1 sine of theta 1 is n2 sine of theta 2. But the n1 and n2, the 1 and the 2 are the, the first medium is the incident medium. So just replace the 1 with incident. And the second medium, the flint glass, is the refractive medium, the refracted refractive medium. All right. And so there we go. So let's go ahead and solve for, we just want to solve this for the refracted medium angle. So sine of theta r is, is ni sine of theta i over nr. And the inverse sine of all that. So an incident 1.33 sine of 60 over 1.58, 47 degrees very straightforward to solve that. So there it is, 47 degree refractive angle. That would be different if it was going from air to the flint, right? Doesn't matter though, as long as you know the index of refraction of the two media. Another thing we could do is, just to look at this, uh, is look at a geometrically uniform, you know, a rectangle here. We've got an incident ray coming into the material we want to trace its path through and show that the direction of the ray coming out is going to be the same as it was going in. Okay, so because N2 in this case is greater than N1, it bends toward the normal. But then when it gets to the other interface, first of all, altered interior angles. These are the two ang same angles. We want to show that theta 3 is equal to theta 1. It's really easy. Just write two equations. n1 sine of theta 1 equals n2 sine of theta 2. So that's the first interface. And now let's write another expression for the second interface. n2 sine of theta 2 is n1 n1 sine of theta 3. Well, what we're going to do here now is just add these. If we add them, notice that we have this n2 sine of theta 2, n2 sine of theta 2 on the, in the equation on both of them, one on each side. So they go away, and we have n1 sine of theta 1 is n1 sine of theta 3. The n1s divide out, and obviously if sine of theta 1 is sine of theta 3, theta 1 is theta 3. And we have just demonstrated that little factoid, which is probably a little bit intuitive anyways. Of course, now if these w surfaces were not parallel to each other, now we would have a different story. But it would still be relatively easy to solve because you would just have to get the correct angles 
if they were in parallel to each other.